Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Neville and welcome to Selective Imagery. I started taking pictures when I was seven or eight years old and I really shoot just about everything. And here's some samples of what I take, whether it be sunrises, alligators, birds, birds, birds. It's what I do a lot of right now. But I also do macro. I'll do small animals and I'll do street photography and I'll use my old cameras to take some black and white photos with. So here's a sample of uh, one of my cameras coming up. So I'm a generalist but right now I'm focused a lot on wildlife and birds in particular. So I hope you enjoy my channel and let's get right to the show. Welcome to a documentary called Another Year, Another Fish Kill at Huntington Beach State Park, South Carolina. We start off with a video of wood storks and egrets. At this moment in time, things seem to be okay. Although the summer heat has been brutal with reported ocean temperatures over 90 degrees F and air temps for an extended period of time, into August in the high 90s would feel like temps of 108 degrees F or higher. The area affected the most when we get these temperatures is Mullet Pond, which is on the right side of the road entering the park, while the left side of the road is the tidal marsh area. There are a manual gate valves that can be opened by the park to either add marsh water to the pond or remove water from the pond into the marsh. The pond is considered brackish, which by definition can have a large degree of variability, but has been tested and is commonly in the 20 plus parts per thousand range, although according to park management the goal is to be around 15 parts per thousand. For the record, freshwater is zero parts per thousand. The Atlantic Ocean is 35 or 36 parts per thousand, depending on the source of your information. So basically 3.5 to 3.6 percent of the weight of seawater comes from salt. In the southeast, as you travel up through rivers, salt marshes and tidal creeks have low salinity, less than 5 to 10 ppt. Closer to the ocean, which would apply to Huntington Beach State Park, salt marshes and tidal creeks are saltier, ranging between 25 to 35 PPT or parts per thousand. In the case of Mullet Pond, salinity can vary due to rainfall, fresh water entering Mullet Pond from a control gate in Mallard Pond, which is at the opposite end of the pond from the road, aka causeway, and is fresh water. Uh, the video you're watching now is obviously just a gator having a little fun and everything seems quite normal here. Upcoming you'll see a video of a great egret catching a fish on the marsh side. And you could tell this fish is pretty healthy. It's trying to get away. Its tail is flipping around. You know, it knows it's going down, but at least it's moving around a little bit. Soon things will change. When we get back to the pond side, here's an eel. It's as limp as can be, normally wrapping itself around the beak of the bird. There's no fight in it. Here is a very large shrimp. Once again, limp as can be. Uh, here's a video of a snowy trying to down a very large shrimp. This is not typical of them to even be able to get shrimps this size. Uh, normally, they're, they're getting shrimp that are like maybe three, four inches long and very, very thin. Um, so, as you can see, it's having a difficult time even being able to handle uh, the shrimp. It is just not used to something this big. So, here's where you start scratching your head and saying, something has changed, something is not right, 
So basically at this point in time on the pond side, we're in the throes of a fish kill. The oxygen levels are extremely low, which causes shrimp to go to the surface of the water. The large shrimp are going to get affected the most. And basically, you can tell it's extremely lethargic. There's no movement in this shrimp at all. It's not able to put up a fight at all. And it's eat, being eaten by a bird that isn't used to handling anything this large. And you'll see subsequent images of other birds getting shrimp. And uh, this day, um, you could call it shrimp fest. That's what my Bob, my friend Bob and I call um, when we see these types of events is a uh, shrimp fest like you'd have at Red Lobster. Uh, here's some still images of that snowy egret with the shrimp. Finally, it breaks the head off. And because it breaks the head off, eventually it's able to swallow uh, the rest of the shrimp. But like I said, this is not something that it's used to dealing with. And there it is going down the pike right there. Here is a video of the eel battle, which you could tell the only movement is caused by the bird shaking the eel, not because of the eel, followed by some shrimp. Uh, videos and you can just watch these while I continue to talk about some uh, specifics here. Uh, according to the guide to salt marshes and tidal creeks in the southeastern U.S., salt marsh tidal creek systems have salinities between 10 and 35 parts per thousand. Vegetation is dense and dominated by smooth core grass which is common in our marsh. Other sources of info State brackish tidal communities occur where water salinity levels are between 0.5 and 18 parts per thousand and water levels are less than 6 feet at high tide. So you're probably saying, why am I talking so much about salinity levels when the cause of a fish kill is due to low dissolved oxygen levels in the water which result in hypoxia and kill the fish, shrimp, etc. As you can see, here's another shrimp that just is not moving at all. Basically because introducing oxygenated water from the marsh side of the pond side may have prevented this. Some argue the salinity level is too different between the two sides. Previous testing would indicate that is not necessarily true. And during last year's tropical storm, marsh water washed over the road at King Tide onto the pond, damaging the roadway and washing away large rocks that abutted the road and did not result in fish dying. The pond side has or had mullet that lives in salt and brackish bodies of water. Flounder or salt water, shrimp you will see in the videos are salt water, blue crabs, etc. So the pond is not a freshwater haven, as some people might suggest, since the species previously mentioned are saltwater, indigenous, but can live in brackish water. Now pay attention to this gator video, because as it goes out, you're going to see some splashing from some larger fish that are basically trying to get oxygen, and you might even see the head pop up with the mouth gasping for air. Right about there, just in front of the nose, the head popped up where it was trying to get some air. So, the, you know, these are just all um, basically the effects of the uh, reduced oxygen levels in the water. And you got to remember, prior to the road being uh, made, what we call a pond was actually part of the marsh. So sediment is full of dissolved salts, salts from eons ago. Here's images of a great egret trying to swoop down while flying to get a shrimp. It was unsuccessful, followed by some videos of the snowy egrets getting very small shrimp and a few more still images. So, okay, what about low oxygen levels? According to the University of Florida, fish require five parts per million of oxygen to survive. Any lower than that, they have trouble. Below two parts per million, an immediate fish kill will occur. With apparent approval of the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, they allowed Huntington Beach State Park to lower water levels in controlled areas such as Mullet Pond in the spring to attract small shorebirds and provide feeding areas 
for birds migrating to and from the Arctic. Although one can easily argue adequate feeding resources exist on the marsh side during low tide. All I can say is that last year and this year when the water level has been lowered in the early spring, algae blooms appeared along with huge increase in growth of grasses and plant life since they were exposed to more direct sunlight. And while plant life generates oxygen, it can also consume more oxygen than it produces, especially when you have cloudy or rainy days. Plants can stop photosynthesizing during extended periods of clouds and rain, and as plant life dies, it is also consumed by bacteria that can reduce the oxygen level. So even in the August time frame when the water level has been higher, the plant life that bloomed is now still there under the water. Obviously, too many fish can deplete oxygen. Increase in plant deb debris can explode the level of bacteria, which will reduce the oxygen. And of course, the higher the water temperatures, the less, the less oxygen that it will hold. Several concerned photographers have written to the head of the state parks and the local park management, and I personally have not received any response. I can't speak for other people. Last year, I wrote a letter predicting a fish kill event, which did occur, and even wrote another letter providing details on underwater aeration equipment that was reasonably priced that could be installed in the pond to increase the oxygen levels. I would argue introducing and keeping a healthy mix of marsh water into the pond would add more oxygenated water, as well as food into the pond ecosystem, and may alleviate the need for aeration equipment. And as you can see, this snowy is just picking apart, you know, shrimp after shrimp after shrimp after shrimp, which shouldn't even be floating on the top if it wasn't for the reduced O2. That's what's causing this problem. And here's, you know, one of the fish that was an easy kill. Some more shrimp images. Oops, that one disappeared and fell. Well, there's another egret with a with a shrimp. And hey, gators have to eat too. This one did find a blue crab. Gee, I guess it's not salt water over here, is it? <laughs> Pun intended. So upcoming, you have more still images with shrimp. You have um, osprey in flight. You have eagle in flight. You have gulls getting shrimp. And at the end, you have a young anhinga trying to carry along a large fish, which is not moving at all, and loses it in the end. Now, um, from a visual perspective, this year's fish kill seems less disastrous than last year. Last year, you had flounder and mullet floating on top of the water, stinking up the whole causeway area, which led to someone, I assume the park, to remove or have removed. The dead fish. This year there are few if any large flounder or mullet left to die and the other species of larger fish are just below the surface and are being consumed by the gators and some birds that will eat near dead fish. Many will not. The bottom dwellers such as flounder, eels, shrimp and other large fish die first but that doesn't mean the small ones are not stressed. When you see large shrimp completely lethargic or near death being eaten by birds that would only get much smaller ones, and fish being pulled out of the water by egrets sitting in the water, this is insane. Even terns are catching and trying to digest fish much bigger than their usual diet. Symptoms of shrimp with lacking dissolved oxygen is that they concentrate near the water surface, edges of ponds, near any position where water could enter the pond, even the small shrimp, which still move a bit, are in the grasses on top of the water and, as shown in my previous video, being plucked out of the grasses and eaten by snowy egrets. So why the video? Well, to get people to pay attention to what is going on, to hopefully get park management to rethink their strategy along with other higher level departments, to stop lowering the pond water in the spring, at least not to the degree that they have created sandbars and areas in the middle of the pond that birds are walking across and at a minimum flow water between the marsh and pond side, sides on a regular basis to help ensure a healthy ecosystem 
and one that can survive during stressful conditions, and if necessary, implement aeration equipment, not fountains, to keep the O2 levels adequate. When people visiting the park or camping in the park notice what's going on, which they do, the first people they ask are the photographers. Collectively, we are there every day and document and see the activity regarding nature in the park real time. Park rangers do not make themselves present within the park to interact with visitors. In six years, I've never seen one ranger on the causeway or near the walkway along Mallard Pond specifically to talk to folks to answer questions or actually be aware of what's going on. To say this is a natural event is only partially true. Once that road was installed and created a pond in the park, the park has a responsibility to maintain that pond in good health. It had no problems before the road was there. All I can say in the past two years with the let's lower the water level in November through May has resulted in disaster. This was not the case in prior years when this was not done and the water was exchanged going both directions between the marsh and the pond. Just my personal opinion and observations from someone living here for six years and visiting for over 30. These videos show a sad state of affairs in my opinion. You could draw your own conclusions. I'm sure there's some out there that are going to say, well, you got some great images. You got some great video. What are you complaining about? What I'm complaining about is a lot of this I should never have gotten, at least not to this extent. And it's primarily due to having a, a buffet banquet of um, dying species of fish and shrimp. Uh, just waiting to get plucked out of the water by gulls who would usually be at the beach trying to steal food from beachgoers. So it didn't make me happy. It made me sad. And I hope if it does anything that it makes you make phone calls or ask questions and say, what can we do to make sure that we minimize the chances of this ha happening again? Because I think um, two years in a row is two years too many. And we need to start taking a different approach. So, as I say, folks, enjoy life. Go out and capture it. Hopefully, I'll never be doing another video like this. And here is that dropped dead fish from the Anhanga. And there it goes. Take care, everyone, and uh, God bless. Here are my final thoughts. After doing research and reviewing past statements made by the park, which are in writing, I might add, I decided to add this section to the video. The park at some point has decided that lowering the water level drastically from starting in November to May time frame is conducive to providing a feeding environment for birds migrating to and from the Arctic and allows them access to invertebrates they need to survive and supports the waterfowl. Although I would argue as previously stated, at least regarding the Arctic birds, just wait till low tide on the marsh side and the food opportunities exist. But for now, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that opinion. However, to try to change the environment of the pond from salinity levels that were in the low to mid 20s to 15 parts per thousand is affecting how the biology of the pond was as previously mentioned, causing ex excessive plant growth due to the decreased water levels, and contributing to fish kills and affecting the balance in the pond environment that existed prior to these changes. The park will say if we fill the pond with marsh water and increase the salinity to 35 parts per thousand, it will kill brackish wildlife. First of all, most of us are saying allow some marsh water to flow back and forth, have an interchange of the water to provide food and oxygenated water for the fish during the year and especially during the heat of the summer so we won't have fish kills. This would not result in a salinity level of 35 parts per thousand. Probably put it back into what was the, the typical 20 to 25 parts per thousand. But remember, before the pipes that run from the marsh side 
to the pond side that were one time completely open before they had valves put on them and before that road was ever there everything there was marsh now the statement that you will kill the brackish life is false I researched the brackish saltwater species fish and the majority of the fish can and do live in salt water and can survive in brackish water. The only fish that can't are largemouth bass that have to be in less than five parts per thousand and peacock bass that can't live where the salt water mixes with the fresh. So if you're controlling it at 15 parts per thousand anyway, those fish wouldn't survive irregardless. Although I don't believe they exist in the pond anyway, so basically it's irrelevant. You don't have freshwater fish that live in brackish water, at least not here. You have saltwater fish that can live in brackish water. Some of these fish species live in saltwater, brackish water, and some even in freshwater. Flounder, striped bass, red drum, mullet. Obviously, the wildlife in the pond is from the marsh side. They're not from a freshwater source. It is obviously, it's obvious that part of this planning is to make it attractive to what's known as dabbling ducks, which is one of three species of ducks in, so in South Carolina, which are primarily freshwater ducks. There's 13 species. That include teals, mallards, wood ducks, etc. And keeping the salinity low will attract these types of ducks. If you bring in marsh water and, and you know a lot of it, which I'm not saying is right or wrong, it would affect some of these ducks whether they show up or not. This is probably why you have the refusal to mix marsh water into the pond side more than the you will kill the brackish wildlife which is a convenient statement to make when you basically have a hidden agenda many of us know that let's say individuals have had a long interest in trying to turn um, mullet pond into a duck pond um, which is really really a foolish thing to think that you can do because you can control the parts per thousand of salinity to that 15 level and that only works until you have um, king tides with a tropical storm or a hurricane and then the guess what the pond gets filled with salt water from the marsh side and uh, you, you now no longer have anywhere near 15 parts per thousand. So Mother Nature is going to continually find a way to fight you when you're trying to control that low level of salinity in the pond. Now, the park also has a famous saying to us photographers who they don't particularly care for, which I don't quite understand because we provide them a lot with a lot of free advertising to get people in that park that camp there, one, to enjoy the beaches, but primarily to enjoy the nature. But they like to say to us, well, let nature be nature. But here you are trying to change the biology of the pond, which to be honest, it isn't up to me to decide what that should be. Or I would argue even you to decide. If anything, you should be maintaining it uh, to what it's always been and you're not doing that right now um, if you want to change it to support different wildlife species at the risk of maybe damaging others which you have you should have open discussions with the residents of South Carolina and you owe it to the visitors that come here and travel hundreds of miles to take pictures of osprey feeding on fish in that pond, of which while there's three or four currently uh, young ones doing that, 
They're few and far between and nowhere near what they were before you started fooling around with the water levels of the pond. So I think you need to have discussions with the residents. Here's what we're doing and why. It is supported by the following studies that have been done. It will benefit these species, but may have a detrimental effect on others and result in, in yearly fish kills. The public should have a say, since it's a public park, regarding how you manage Mullet Pond, and you need to be honest with the community. I personally would support whatever is decided within a public forum, and I think you owe it to the public, to the visitors that travel, in some cases, thousands of miles to come to that park, not to go lay on the beach. They could go stay at a hotel and be very comfortable and basically enjoy the beach, the beach areas there. Okay, they come to the park in many cases to have that balance of being able to see wildlife, being able to see alligators, being able to see painted buntings, be able to see um, large quantities of fish and anhinga and cormorants and, you know, every, egrets and everything else we get to enjoy. So I think you owe it to the community and to the people who visit here to have an open discussion on what you're doing and what your plans are for the future uh, for that, for the park, period. And I'll leave it at that. And everyone take care and hey, get active in the community, write letters, ask questions, like I said before. Have a good one.